Did the cloud you? Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, welcome everyone to of Life Science Five Week Fourteen. Uh, Times really fly very, very quickly. Uh, as you just mentioned, we do have an icebreaker question asking you about bet. Uh, tell us about it if you do have one. If you don't, uh, what bet you would prefer to have? Uh, our engagement is governed by the code of conduct, uh, which you can find in line 40. Uh, if this is your first time really joining us, the code of conduct is simply meant to provide uh, a safe space to everyone. So if you do experience or witness any kind of unacceptable behavior or have any other concern, please do report it by contacting one of the organizers, uh, Bernice, Malvika, Emmy, and Joe at uh, team at overlifescience.org. Uh, if you do prefer to email just one of the member individually, uh, you can find all of their email, individual email at line 42. Uh, we also have Ether AI available. Uh, which you can, so it means you can follow the transcript of the session by clicking in the top left of the screen. Of the screen. Um, yeah, that's pretty much all the housekeeper role. Uh, today's call gonna actually discuss one of my favorite topic, which is the motivation and practicality in practice in open science. So we're gonna speak about fair software, fair data, publishing and citing research code. Uh, and without further ado, I'm so, so delighted to introduce Philip, the, the first speaker, to speak about the future of open science and fair data. Uh, over to you, Philip. We may is, have a problem. Is, it, <laughs> is, he, is he not here? He's not here. Yeah. Um, shall we? Uh, we have to, I'm going to... Yeah, go on. Pull the reflection exercise. Let's do that first and see if okay. it shows up. Um, so I'll just grab it and pull it up to the top if you um... Okay. Right, if you can, um, if you're good to introduce that at all, I'm just going to yeah. see if I can ch uh, check. So, yeah, uh, so we're going to do um, a silent reflection. We invite you to reflect and uh, if you could make one element of research dissemination easier, different, what would that be and why? Uh, if you can relate that to your own project, you have personal experience, um, that would be awesome. You can write it here at line uh, 66. So we're going to take um, eight minutes, starting now, silently trying to reflect and add in your thoughts, uh, starting from line 71. Along, uh, I think data availability to work and should be more openly available, uh, less pricey, uh, rethinking the way research outputs are published, traditional publication are fine, but the new type of innovative type of publishing should be encouraged as well. Um, I hope we will have more funding for, uh, for research at work uh, on long term, uh, free ourselves from uh, archaic practice of disseminating knowledge in WhatsApp text, um, a hard requirement of all models, simulation, uh, and analysis code to be released and verified when published, um, uh, more access to dissemination strategy and training. Um, so lots of really, really interesting thoughts. Um, anyone would like to share or expand or elaborate in their thought? Don't feel shy. Okay. 
Okay, uh, you would like to elaborate in your thought about uh, uh, reviewing journals that we do for free? It's a good one. Um, as I think it perhaps there's something we've been trying to maybe show in our list that we try not to ask people to do too much is that we try and at least pay um, an honorarium for every reasonably small job that we ask people to do. Um, and there's a few reasons. I think the one that's most important to me is that you're never going to have diverse viewpoints because time is not an equally distributed privilege. That we, It's not something that everyone has in equal amounts. And we're always going to under and over represent people if we only expect people to do it in um, put in quotes volunteer time. And I note that Esther has actually just joined and I won't put her on the spot, but she did write a fantastic blog that was on the OLS website very recently, just talking about the fact that lots of the service work um, in science um, tends to be unpaid and extra, which means that it isn't necessarily distributed fairly. I've read that blog post. I'm trying to find it. Yeah, it's about open science is not a hobby. It's a very, very interesting one. Uh, I'm going to find the link just in a few seconds. Um, anyone else would like to share their thought before we move on to the next talk? I still don't see Philip, do I? Uh, yeah, I don't see him yet. Okay. I think what we'll do, we'll proceed uh, with the next talk after that instead. Uh, and worst case, we'll finish the cohort call a bit early. No one will complain. <laughs> okay. So would you like to introduce the second speaker, you? Fantastic. Okay. Let me hop down. So skipping lines 87 and hopping over to uh, line 101. Uh, so um, we're really excited to have a fantastic representative from the organization policy, which has released some of the most amazing reports I think I've read recently. Um, Gilbert, are you here and are you ready? Yes, I'm here. Hello, everyone. How are you? Fantastic. Uh, so I will uh, let you introduce yourself further. You'll probably introduce me better. Uh, so you'll introduce yourself better than I will. Um, and over to you. Yes, thank you very much, Yo. I'm happy to be here. Um, hello, everyone. Um, Gilbert Bayamba. It's around seven, a quarter past seven uh, p.m. where I'm uh, down here in Kampala, East Africa. And I'm excited to be speaking to all of you. I don't know if you're all in the same location or you're scattered around the world like my team is always is. <laughs> yeah, so Gilbert, um, the director of uh, programs at Policy, Policy with a double L, um, a civ tech uh, feminist uh, organization working at the intersection of uh, data research and design. Um, it's very interesting when I mention uh, the intersectionalities that we work at and how we kind of bring all of them uh, together. I'll give an example. Uh, we have a report, uh, we worked with a community, slum community in the city of Kampala where we're talking about service delivery. And because this is a community that is semi-illiterate and we had worked with them in terms of collecting data, um, analyzing the data, and realize we need to also actually dis distribute the findings in a way that they basically understand. And what was the best way to do that? We brought in uh, artists and they utilized uh, street murals to um, share the findings from the report. Because at the end of the day, if we had developed a, P a PDF and put it online, this community wouldn't really get access to, to the findings. So, Utilizing uh, these kind of um, interesting uh, ways, uh, for example, using chatbots, uh, using uh, gamification, artistry, uh, also things like radio shows or events um, to distribute uh, or disseminate our findings and engaging the community kind of puts us apart in terms of the work we do, but also in how we engage the communities that we work in and how we involve them in our research, not only just for them uh, to be uh, interviewers or 
providing us the data, but also giving them the recommendations so that we work with them to uh, either make policymakers accountable or make decision makers and their leaders accountable in terms of uh, changing uh, service delivery. And that's why we always end our profile saying we're basically working to improve service delivery uh, within the African context. Policy works uh, across Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, we're a very lean team. We're less than uh, 30 staff members uh, with the only office in Kampala, Uganda, but with team members uh, scattered across uh, Africa, but also some outside Africa. Uh, for example, we have two uh, staff members working from Germany, and I think we recently had a staff member who was in the US, and I think she has moved back to Uganda now. Uh, we've also been able to expand our work beyond Africa. Uh, we have projects uh, uh, in India, collaborating with another partner in India, but also running another project um, with Internews with the support of USID, uh, working within Africa, but also Latin America, uh, because the project is looking at languages um, within the context of the continents that we are in. Yeah, in a nutshell, um, that is about me. I'm a very introverted person. So in a normal daily setting, I wouldn't be <laughs> able to stand and speak. But with technology, sometimes I forget and I feel like I'm speaking to my laptop and I'm able to talk to an audience. Um, and my background is in IT. I have a bachelor's in IT, but I'm currently finishing my master's in international business administration from China. Um, yeah, I've worked a lot in social enterprise, but uh, also with the NGO space, I've done a lot of work with uh, behavior change, specifically in sexual reproductive health. I'm making three years at policy, so moving to the data science space uh, or research space is fairly new for me, but uh, very interesting in terms of how uh, a safe tech organization like policy is trying to create change. Uh, like you has said, uh, we have some of the most interesting uh, reports um, that have been uh, put out there. I think for me, my most current and interesting one that you all need to uh, read, um, there are two of them. Uh, one of them um, is called uh, Invisible. Uh, it's basically looking at Muslim women and how they utilize online platforms, but also the other one is a guide uh, called Inclusion, Not Just an Add-on, uh, where we worked with uh, the team at Meta to basically uh, provide a guide to big tech platforms in terms of how they could be inclusive when they're designing their platforms. For me, that is very, very um, interesting uh, piece of work because at the end of the day, we're challenging the big techs uh, uh, or any other person developing a, a platform to really not look at uh, inclusion as just an add-on, but think through it from the design process. And that's why uh, I love the work at policy because when it comes to um, looking at the communities or um, the persons we are targeting, we tend to work with them, not for them. So we involve them from the start, um, be it uh, developing, let me say, uh, the questionnaire to going out to collecting the data to analyzing it and translating it into uh, products. Most of our recommendations are translated into uh, products, and most of these products could be a simple chatbot. We have done a study on um, online gender based violence against women, and we felt like translating that into a chatbot would make more sense uh, for the community we are targeting. Uh, because people may not be able to sit down and read the whole PDF. So this chatbot actually also provides you more resources beyond what the uh, report is uh, talking about. Um, we have done a study on online gender-based violence during uh, general elections uh, in Uganda. And with that, we came up with a, a game called Addicto Safety T to help women uh, keep safe. Um, uh, online and this is basically a resource that uh, you don't need to go to maybe a training to understand digital safety but you can play the game using the three characters that we have developed to help you uh, look at your digital hygiene as a woman or as any person 
So translating these recommendations into interesting uh, products is very uh, key for us. We don't just want to do research and then uh, show our findings, but uh, work with the community and see how best we can translate uh, this into very interesting um, products for them to use. Uh, one of the very interesting uh, things we've done also is uh, movement building. Why movement building and why it's very key and why I speak about it, especially for this session. Um, working for a feminist organization, but also when you look at feminism, there are also um, intersectionality of different genders. Uh, and looking at the context that we work in, um, looking at persons with uh, disability, the LGBTI community, uh, trans women, most of these people are literally left out when you come to uh, digitalization or utilizing digital tools. Uh, and for us working, for example, I'm, I'm leading on a project uh, called Agile uh, Research for uh, Policy Making. And it's basically a gender project because we're looking at how key population within the country are utilizing data for advocacy. But we've come to um, at a, a crossroad whereby we don't have gender data because in the community we are in Uganda, they look at um, gender data as between male and female and that's it. But there's so many other genders when you come to really, uh, if you've studied gender or if you've um, read more about gender. There's so many other individuals that are left out that are just categorized under female or male. And these people don't have specific needs or require specific services. So if you don't disaggregate your data very well, you're not able to meet the criteria in terms of uh, providing them the available, the necessary uh, resources. So for us, it's very key. And uh, when we did the study on online gender-based violence, uh, especially around political leaders, we translated this into uh, a resource uh, or a project called uh, Vote Women. And Vote Women is basically looking at women politicians and how they can uh, utilize uh, uh, online platforms to um, reach out to their constituency, but also um, develop their leadership skills, resource mobilize and all that. So we have translated this into a curriculum that we just launched recently, both in Uganda and Tanzania. Uh, our plan was to cover East Africa, but Kenya is going through elections and one of our funders is not willing to inject resources into a space where uh, elections are happening so that they don't come off as if they're trying to influence uh, change through democratic processes like elections, but hopefully next year we'll be moving to that. And for me, I sat in one of the meetings um, when we were launching the curriculum in Uganda and a woman politician saying that this has come timely because this is a resource they needed even during elections, but they're happy that it has come now. For me, it shows the magnitude of the work that we are doing and how it's impacting the society because these leaders were basically grassroots leaders. They're not even uh, members of parliament or ministers. They're basically simple councillors on ground. And they explained how their families were telling them not to share their own personal stories or their personal lives, like sharing a picture of their child online, how that could be harmful to their families. And our curriculum is trying to help them look at things like digital security, digital safety, uh, personal data. How do you how do you share that kind of information? You are an excited, you're a mother who wants to show off how your daughter has performed well, um, maybe say at school, but again, you're a leader, you're a politician, and you could be targeted. Sharing your daughter and her school could be uh, harmful not only to her, but also to you, her family, but also her school. So how do you uh, work within this context? And the curriculum being able to address this for the women leaders for us is very exciting and helps us in uh, movement building because at the end of the day, we're talking about data science. We're talking about all these interesting bits that need to, uh, data scientists need to do, or create these platforms, make them engaging and all that. But also we're looking at the users. So at the end of the day, the users are also influencing how these platforms should be created. 
Um, with that, we interacted with Meta Facebook and did um, a, a session, a workshop on uh, their policies online and how uh, they um, affect uh, the end users. So doing such interventions for us helps in terms of uh, opening up the space because now even non-tech people tend to understand how the tech platforms affect their day-to-day -day lives and how they can contribute to those. Being able to know how to report someone who is cyberbullying someone and going through the channels the platforms are put through, that for us is a very great uh, opportunity because some of these people don't know these uh, resources and how to utilize them. So opening up the space beyond just the uh, data scientists and the tech developers helps in terms of movement building, but also contributes in terms of improving how these platforms uh, can be utilized um, uh, by the end user. Um, I'm going to stop there and in case there are any questions before I continue, so I can add or if you want me to highlight on something uh, that I've spoken about, so feel free to uh, share. Thanks, Gilbert. Uh, folks, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat, you can unmute them or uh, you can put them in the etherpad as well. All are good. Um, and I have one question I will ask while we um, wait for others to bring stuff in. Uh, so Gilbert, that's been really, really interesting just hearing about the work that you've done with policymakers, um, with the general public. And I know um, at least one person here will have a comment on who is the general public, because that can be a lot of different people and a lot of, a lot of different subjects. Um, but uh, general education and making, ma making science approachable. Um, and given that uh, we're all here largely as a group of people who are very interested in research and in sharing our outputs and our work openly, um, what would your tip, Gilbert, be perhaps if you, were, if you wanted to take a subject that maybe wasn't straightforward and make it approachable to a lay person? Um, thank you very much uh, for that question. Um, one of the things that we love doing at Policy is um, convening people. Um, COVID became uh, a very big challenge and we thought through creative ways in terms of how we make convenings because it's from the convenings that people learn, share, but also make technical things very simple depending on the subject matter and who is uh, delivering this information. And working in a context whereby uh, things around data science are always complex, especially for the semi-literate uh, community. Uh, for example, my colleague was doing a study on how persons with disability interface with um, technology and how they utilize it, especially um, given the COVID uh, pandemic. And we found out that even the big institution that was very prominent about uh, interacting with persons with disability was struggling to reach out to these persons with disability and telling them how they have these tools, the assistive technologies to assist them with their, with their interactions with uh, tech platforms. And with this, we, because the study helped us also understand how persons with disability kind of receive information, we utilize that uh, finding. For example, radio talk shows and community dialogues were a very big hit uh, in terms of reaching persons with disability, especially in rural communities. And we translated that and we put our report into a more accessible channel. So we used radio platforms, we did community engagements, community dialogues where persons with disability would uh, come in and they got to know about these tools and where to find them and uh, their affordability or even available resources they can tap into to receive these tools. And realize, for example, the university that has a big component on uh, disability inclusion uh, did know how to um, utilize these platforms or so they didn't know that this was a very easy technique and it's available resource radio. It's one of the cheapest and easiest way to reach people in within the African context. So again, at the end of the day is how do you do your study and also how do you interact with the subject matter and making sure that you helped to ease uh, 
um, the findings in a way that people really understand and they can uh, utilize them. Talking about gatherings, when you talk about data science, it's very hard. For example, we are organizing Data Fest Africa. And uh, this time we became ambitious to take some of these gatherings outside the normal uh, city centers to the rural community or upcountry districts. But finding organizations or entities working within uh, data science space in those communities is very hard. And we don't want to ship people from an urban center to that community and then ship them back. I mean, we're not building the community. We need to work within uh, the space there. But probing more and really, really um, interacting with the people on the ground, we actually realized that people working with data, working on data issues, but because we are putting the word data science, we're making it very complex. When people hear the word science already, you're eliminating. When they sent me the invite, I took actually some time to respond. And I'm like, I'm not a scientist. What am I going to even share? What does this science bit mean? But when you probe more, you actually realize we're limiting ourselves because of the big words that we throw out there. And these are simple uh, tools and resources that actually people um, uh, already have. Uh, for example, when COVID hit and ministry was trying to translate some of these big words um, for the common man. I know I was in a workshop at ministry um, and uh, behavior change team at ministry say they struggled to translate the word quarantine, like quarantine when you have or uh, isolate yourself. They struggled with that word and big international media were using the word and writing it out. And they said, hey, this may not be a, a word that can be translated in the local language, but how do we work with musicians to really um, uh, change or make the word simpler in a way that people understand, you get. and if you look at uh, COVID and you look at, um, there's a partner, there's an organization, I think it's called PVI, was tracking in terms of how many uh, songs were released during uh, the COVID period in Uganda. And most of these songs are using English words, but translating them or putting uh, a local language um, um, connotation to the word. So quarantine here, you say quarantine, you get, you're trying to make it translate into a local language, but also for people to understand. And when the musician keeps on singing, you tend to get the meaning of the song because it's talking about quarantine and staying in the house alone where you don't have what to eat because most of these people are uh, living hand to mouth and they don't have resources uh, because I'm going to the market to sell my commodities for the day to be able to uh, find something to feed my family. So you're quarantined, the markets are closed and you don't have the resources. So translating this into a very uh, relatable situation for the community. Uh, so again, you was asking what is community? Community is a typical normal person that you didn't think would interact with your, with your studies or your research or your work that you're working on. That is a typical, I could be a typical uh, common person or public because I'm not uh, maybe interacting with bio data information on a daily and all that. So having that at the back of your mind and trying to simplify the language. Language is very key and language is not just spoken language. You could translate into text. You could translate it with a sign language interpreter. You could print large fonts, um, but also making sure that you use simple language, English, simplify it. Uh, for the end user. For example, I, I found out recently that uh, the Spanish community has so many open resource uh, tools and platforms, and they're not translated into English, yet they're utilizing them a lot. So again, there's a limit there to utilize those tools because they are very well developed in the Spanish language, but they're not uh, translated into the English. So I, I mean, me as a common man, Bill, but I'm already <laughs> eliminated in terms of utilizing these tools. So as you're developing your work or your work, you're doing any work, you need to also think through the end user. Um, like you have said, most of our work has been, uh, had reached out to so many uh, persons that even to uh, organizations wouldn't think would even cite our work. 
But what has helped, it's open source tools like uh, Google Translator that has helped translate some of this work into uh, the languages that the end user is using and we didn't know. Um, and because some of these tools are limiting, for example, Swahili is not uh, well covered within the Google Translator, we tend to go ahead and find um, resourceful persons that can help us translate this. Uh, for example, you can find us translating work that we have done like three, four years back, but because it's very resourceful and it's very key uh, for the community, we end up translating it nevertheless because we believe there's someone else who may want to uh, utilize it and use it. So translation is very key, uh, but also making it very accessible uh, in terms of how do you disseminate it. Um, uh, for example, we've been trying our level best to improve our, our, our website. It's not at 100% where we want it. Uh, it doesn't have um, audio speech um, or, uh, embedded in. So we're trying to make sure we make the platform where we're putting the resources very, very accessible, but also very cognizant of the fact that most of our work is in a very sensitive uh, environment. So we also tend to make sure that we protect uh, our data in a way that we don't disseminate all kinds of data. You may go there on our website and find our current two reports. For you to access them, you have to first write to us uh, because we are also very keen in terms of protecting the end user because if you provide all the information to the public and you don't keep track of who is uh, having access to this information also can put the end user in harm's way. So we also have that at the back of our mind because most of the work we do, we design with the end user uh, rather than us uh, imposing our thoughts and our work onto, onto them. I think I'll stop there and I'll take another question. I don't know if you have really answered your question. No, that was great. I think it was really amazing to listen to like the different ways you've made things approachable, um, thinking not only about the language um, but, but making sure that it's, it's in the correct language as well as in approachable language. Um, I know Jenna had a quick question um, and there's also one from Stefan. Uh, so I will take those two questions and then we'll move on to the other Stefan who will be presenting after you. Uh, so Jenna, do you want to um, ask your question? Yeah, thank you. I also wrote it on the, on the Etherpad, but basically I was wondering um, if you have any policy or you've ever encountered issues when third parties disseminate your research and findings, because in science it often happens that if you do a more um, open dissemination, some newspaper, or some news media, or whatever that is, they take up on what you've written and they kind of share it, but because they don't have the technical knowledge, it's perhaps not 100% accurate. Um, so I don't know if you have any, um, insights into that topic? Uh, definitely, uh, that has happened. So recently, for example, the Vote Women uh, curriculum we developed, um, the reporter we had in the room uh, speaks the local language. And we basically were digesting the news piece that they had developed. And then we realized some words, some technology words are not within the local language. So, uh, if you translate it into English, you can find uh, the, you find the article somewhere somehow is missing out uh, very key components. But for us as policy, we have been very deliberate, and we understand that third parties, especially the media, are very key uh, in the work that we do. We developed a project called the Future of Work, where we are engaging mainly the journalists to understand. Uh, tech-related terminologies, but also tech-related work and how it affects uh, the way we live. So that's why we're speaking the future of work, the way we live and the way we work. Uh, for example, uh, during COVID, uh, journalists are used to press conferences and you call them for a Zoom meeting or a Zoom call when you're releasing something. And they feel like they can't take away something. They can't take a picture of the person speaking but also most of the information is basically uh, handed out to them rather than them really going ahead to probe more and find subject matters that are not in the work you're disseminating. And they found that really, really challenging. What we did uh, is basically also provide resources and tools for them to actually go out in the community. So if we talk about online gender-based violence, 
and we have disseminated this report to them and we have written a press release. We've also put down resources on the side for them to go and interrogate women who have been affected by uh, online gender-based violence. We've gone ahead to map out some of these women, the subject matters for them to speak to and making their work more accessible and easy because we also understand they may not have the time and the resources to go down. Media houses don't provide budgets for uh, investigative stories or for them to really go probe more. So having those resources at the back of your mind or in your planning process is very key, but also understanding, that's why I mentioned when you're working with the community or when you're developing your work, you need to also put in, term, in, in, in consideration the community you're going to interact with. So media is a very big community. So as you're designing, have you designed uh, a tool or resources to support the media to carry on your work that you're working on? Do you have that at the back of your mind? I know you may be a student and it's hard for you, but there are platforms there. There's a journalist student also trying to find this resource. So how do you carry along and convince them to be part of your work? Because she's also looking, or they are also looking for a story to cover. So working in collaboration is very key. And this doesn't mean that you need to have resources. Your, um, uh, a student maybe say studying about um, uh, air pollution uh, within a city. There's a, a student, a journalist student doing uh, air pollution stories and the big factories you get. So how do you share with them your study and your research you're doing, maybe say you're using um, uh, a tool or you've developed uh, a box that kind of uh, that keeps track of uh, air pollution and all that. If you share that too with them as the student is doing a, a story on air pollution, they include you as a solution because you developed a tool or a box that kind of keeps track of uh, this air pollution. So putting that in mind and making sure that you understand that you need to have uh, the target audience as you develop your work is very key, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry, Gemma, I don't know if you had something else you wanted to follow up with there. All good. Okay. Right. Final question then. Um, and before we move on to Stefan, so this is a question from the other Stefan. Uh, sorry, we have two people with almost the same name, spelled slightly differently in the call. So um, I just hope that by context, you can figure out which one I'm talking about at any given time. Um, so Stefan uh, asks, uh, he says, thanks for the great presentation, Gilbert. Working with many stakeholders and local communities is often difficult in terms of reaching out to them. What can be some of the methods you use to approach and interact and maintain interest in your communities? Um, so this could be maybe a quickish one and then we'll move on to um, other Stefan's presentation. <laughs> yes, uh, very fast. You, I think you need to understand that you may not be able to reach out to everyone at the same time. So starting small, is very key and not stretching yourself to tend to reach out to all stakeholders. For example, with our Vote Women curriculum, we said um, with available resources, we can only reach out to 40 women, women leaders, 20 in Tanzania, 20 in Uganda. And when other women kind of show interest, we show them that, hey, this is the first cohort. Uh, we're going to find resources to reach out to another cohort. So don't get so stressed to try to stretch yourself to reach out to so many uh, stakeholders. Map out the key ones. And in most cases, if you're starting small, map out those ones who have a bigger following so that your uh, findings or your study can be cascaded, cascaded to others. And when you're working with them, make sure you empower them to pass on this knowledge to other uh, stakeholders. So that's what we work with in mind. We always look out for those who have a big following, those ones who are more engaging at the start, because when they, they speak about this work, others are more interested rather than finding uh, reaching those ones who have very few uh, followership um, and you kind of struggle to make sure that your work has visibility. So as at the end of the day, uh, these ones with a big following, they kind of create visibility for your work and you reach out to more. And as more come to approach you, may not have the resources, uh, you may find out of uh, making this uh, your work uh, available online and you share those as you tend to look for more resources. And as you work, make, put in mind that this work may be attracted, uh, attracted to so many people. So put in consideration that you also raise more resources in the process of doing your work. 
So if you started this study at the university, how do you find other fellowship programs that can help you to um, build on to this study you've done at school, uh, things like that. I think I will leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can we have a huge round of applause for the incredible practical and as Kim puts it, pragmatic advice that we've had from Gilbert. I think it's been really inspiring to hear. Um, so yeah, I love it. Got a fantastic round of um, clap emojis coming through Zoom. Uh, so Batul, um, well, I'll pass it over to you to introduce our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Gilbert. There's so many lessons that I learned from your talk. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm so happy and excited to introduce Stefan, who's going to speak about how to size softwares. Yeah, over to you, Stefan. Sorry, just trying to start my, um, my screen. So hope you can all see my slides now. Yeah, cool. Uh, thanks, Batul, for the introduction, and thanks uh, for the whole team for inviting me to talk today about uh, something that's close to my heart. It's not just software citation, it's also about something called FAIR software. Um, very, very brief introduction myself. I'm Stefan. I used to be an RSE, a research software engineer in linguistics, and I am now pursuing a PhD in computer science at the German Aerospace Center. I am a fellow of the Software Sustainability Institute, um, and my internet connection is not stable, apparently. Um, today, I'd like to talk about some steps, some hopefully, look, again, more practical advice steps um, that we can take towards fairer and more citable um, research software. So uh, to start at the beginning, some of you may be familiar with the FAIR principles for research data. Uh, and FAIR is an acronym which results to findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable research data. Um, so in the last few years, there has been a push towards adopting these principles for research software as well. Um, the problem is that software is a completely different beast to data um, in, in, in some respects. For example, software is executable, data isn't, software provided, provides a tool, um, data provides evidence, things like that. Software is developed and maintained and published as well in a completely different fashion, um, partly from, from what, how research data is treated. So um, one of the main questions I ask myself is why do we want to apply FAIR principles to software at all when they're made for data? And I think there are at least two good reasons to do so. Firstly, and this is more under the hood, um, we want to make research better and more reproducible. And because software is very crucial, as a crucial component in modern research, um, if software becomes FAIR, that's a great step in the right direction. Um, although FAIR does really not say anything about software quality or robustness or sustainability. And so there's still a lot of work to do, but it's, it's definitely a good, good first step. And the other thing is, is a bit more on the, on the politicky side of things is um, FAIR is really good branding because it's being, being pushed by the research public, uh, by funders as well, by some governments. So uh, to say that differently, management will understand what you talk about when you talk about FAIR. They'll have heard the term, and they probably also have an incentive to push that as well. So by reusing that um, FAIR branding, um, which is uh, a well-known and supportive name, we can hopefully also make it easier to get support for the work we do in making research software better to, to uh, make research better in the end. On a side note, one of the um, interesting things about FAIR is that you, if you cannot make your software open source, as you really should, uh, for some reason, you can still make it FAIR um, because openness is not a prerequisite. I'll, I'll jump into the details in a bit. Um, the other part of my talk is going to, be, going to be about making software citable. And there is some overlap with making software fair, um, specifically that citable software must also be findable software. That's the F in fair. Um, ideally, it should also be accessible and reusable um, because otherwise uh, the number of scenarios in which people would actually want to cite your software is really becoming very small because only software uh, authors that actually cite their, their own software would cite software at all if it's not accessible. Um, so there are very good reasons for you uh, to make your software not only fair, but also open source. And I think it's actually very clear also why you would want to make your software citable. And number one, it's pretty, um, pretty obvious, I think. You put a lot of effort into creating your research software, so it's only, uh, excuse the pun, it's only fair uh, that you should also be able to reap the rewards. And that means um, 
receive academic credit for your work, be able to show that you have, in fact, advanced research. And secondly, um, if people, including yourself, cite your software, this also helps the reproducibility of research results um, in general, especially when they when people cite the exact version of the software they have used uh, to gain research results. So um, on the more practical side of things, how do we actually get to fairer and more citable research software then? Um, sorry for that slide. It looks a bit crowded, but I hope it'll be become more clear in a second. So when you look at the graphic on the right hand side of the slide, you'll see a very high level overview of what FAIR software includes. Um, so when you have all these uh, green buttons in there, or light, light green buttons in there, um, if you can see them as green, just the lighter buttons. Um, you have FAIR software that is not only FAIR, but it's also open source and sustainable. And that includes things like a persistent identifier for the software, for example, a DOI. Um, it includes metadata, yeah, documentation, an open license. Um, and of course, access to the source code is also archived in a long-term archive. Um, ideally also, an executable version of the software is bundled together with the things it needs to run, um, such as the operating system and the dependencies. Um, usually that's done in a container. And there, I think there are some interesting things to note here. Um, first of all, this is the really the diamond level fair software, meaning that's the best you can do. Um, but there's also a very base metal level of fair software, so to speak. And that just consists of uh, the must-haves uh, marked here by the black arrows. Um, you really need to have a PID, so a persistent identifier, DOI, or else um, you need to have metadata and you should have documentation. And that's already enough to make your software fair. Um, this is not something that I would encourage at all, but uh, if you only care for FAIR, then that's it's perfectly permissible to just have these things. Um, I will not talk about all the different requirements for FAIR software because that goes into too much detail. Instead, I'll focus on uh, metadata, software metadata here in general, and citation, citation relevant metadata in particular, because um, well, that's what keeps me up at night, as sad as it may be. Um, right, so, in general, it could be said that FAIR software can be relatively easily achieved um, because you need a PID, you need metadata, you need documentation. Um, how does this work in practice, though? And where does citability come in? Um, if you start, if you go back you know, over to the left hand side of that slide, and if you start at the top, um, the first thing you need is a persistent identifier for your software, which is a DOI. How do you get one? Um, you need to publish your software, um, for example, in an open access repository. Um, Zenodo is one that uh, springs to mind because it's fairly well known and it's uh, general general use, so uh, not community or discipline specific. I'll also talk about Zenodo in just a bit. Um, if you want to publish your software, then you need to provide some metadata for the software. And um, that's pretty much the same as you would uh, do if you, if you published a paper. Um, these metadata you need to provide includes things like the name of the software, the names of the authors of the software, the version of the software perhaps, and those are clearly less cit like citation relevant metadata, if you think about it. So there's that link between FAIR and, and, and citation. Um, of course you can, and you probably also should, provide other metadata such as um, a description of the software, some information where people can get a copy of the software, or access to the source code, some license information, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, when you think about it carefully, it comes down to two things only. A, you publish your software to get a PID, and B, you provide relevant metadata. And I'll very briefly talk about these two things now. Um, one very good way of publishing your software is in Nodo. It's, like I said, an open access repository for digital artifacts in general. It's operated by CERN, and it's also built on open source software, yay. Um, the great thing about Zenodo is that it gives you a lot of the things that you need to make your software fair kind of for free. Um, the screenshot on the left, hope you can see that. I'm going to try and move my uh, mouse cursor there so not to point out some things. Uh, it shows an example of what the landing page for a Zenodo publication of software uh, looks like. You can see, hopefully, um, that there is not only things like the title, which is kind of on the left here, and the list of authors just below that. There is also other metadata, such as the description of the software, some information where to access the software. You have information about licenses further to your right, um, information about what other versions um, than the one you're just looking at is available for the software as well. Um, so that's really a lot, of, a lot of the things you get for free on Zenodo. 
Um, of course, you can download the actual software source code from the landing page as well. So that's is, that's a great place to go for software publication because you not only get a DOI for the version of your software you publish, you also get a parent DOI, which is kind of a collection of, of DOIs of the versions. And uh, that always resolves to the latest published version of the software. Um, such a software publication on Zenodo not only helps you to make your software fair, it's also um, well, it makes your software citable. Um, and that's where we, where we want to be in the end. And there are two potential issues I, I see with, uh, with um, using Zenodo for software publication and citation as the single solution for your, for your software. One is that um, Zenodo can be a bit tedious when it comes to publication because you have to fill in a long online form where you put, out, put in all the details about your software, you upload the files, et cetera. Um, and another issue is that Zenodo is probably not the first place people will go and look for research software. And the good news is that there is a good way to connect Zenodo with another platform that's more likely uh, a place where people go to find software, and that's GitHub. And this is why I'm going to briefly talk about how to leverage GitHub, not only for software citation before you publish to Zenodo, but also how to get around filling in forms manually every time you publish a new version. And the solution is basically something that I'm involved with. Uh, it's called the citation file format. It's basically a format for, well, access citation files, um, which is uh, the idea uh, that you write software metadata, citation metadata into a file. You keep that in your source code repository. This includes mostly um, citation information, but also some other stuff, such as license, um, a description, et cetera, et cetera. Um, CFF files are written in YAML, uh, basically key value pairs. And the good thing about having such a file in your repo is that humans can go and find it and read it and, and probably understand uh, fairly easily uh, what this file is about. You provide citation information even before you publish something. Um, you can also provide the correct DOI for the version um, in your repository once you have that from Zenodo. Um, and you can um, use Zenodo to kind of auto-publish new releases you do on GitHub straight to the repository. There are some more things CFF can do, but that's kind of going too much into detail. The good thing is that there's a number of freebies when you use CFF um, because the metadata in the file will be reused by other platforms as well. So GitHub itself, for example, will show a widget that will give people the um, citation information for copying and pasting straight into the paper. Um, if you publish automatically to Zenodo, then the information from the file will also land in the record. So you don't have to go back and fill in the form uh, because it'll already, uh, it'll be there. There's a number of tools available for that as well. Um, I know I'm short on time. So th this is just a screenshot of one of the tools. Um, it's a form-based website that'll help you kind of set up the first version of your CFF file. And on the right-hand side, you can see what this would look like rendered on GitHub. So by way of conclusion, there are really two basic things that you can do to make your software fairer on the one hand and more citable on the other hand. One is to publish in a place where you get a PID, such as a DOI. Um, the other is to keep a file with software citation metadata in your repository. And you can do so knowing that fair software is a good first step towards better software and therefore hopefully better research. And with this, I'm done. Thanks for listening. Um, I am going to unshare my screen. Once I find the button, there it is. Thank you so much, Stefan. This is very, very enlightening and interesting. Uh, if you do have any questions, Stefan, please do add it in the Zoom chat or feel free to add it at line 142 in the Etherpad. We already got a couple of questions from you asking if I don't write code, what would that say you can see it? That's easier for you. Sorry, I think you were cutting up you were cutting out there for a bit for me, but I'm going to have a look at the at the pad. If you if I don't write code, what would be your one tip for me? Um in terms of making, well, if you don't write code, you don't have to worry about making it fair and citable. <laughs> that's, that's a good start. Um, if you want to um, make whatever it is you publish fair, um, then think about metadata. You can, that will help people 
assess whether the thing you publish is useful for them. So if it's, um, I don't know, if it's a, a, a set of slides, um, make sure you give them the context where you, in which you publish these slides or have used them. If it's uh, data, well, there's lots of uh, things to, to take care of when you talk about data. And I'm not a data expert, so I'm not gonna give you false advice, but metadata is really the key to understanding um, the research artifacts better and also avoid having to do things over and over again, which is the case with what happens with software at the moment is that you get a new grant and you kind of look around for a bit, you don't see anything because it's not been well described with metadata and then you start kind of implementing the exact same thing and you or something slightly different that you know could have saved a lot of time um, by just reusing what's there already and adapting that to your own to your own use case. Hope that can answer the question. Yeah, um, actually, when we try to implement the SFF format in one of the, like a few in the GitHub repository that we do have, I found like the structure was not straightforward at first, but then when I went to that link for the SFF in it, uh, the link that you gave it, it make it so, so much easier. Like, yeah, so I love that a lot. Uh, Jim also is asking, have you thought about having templates to make sure when get to meaningful, uh, the metadata, I'm just based to, the question into the Zoom chat if you want to see that. Yeah, um, audio is fine again. Yes, well, um, there are some templates around. There are a few templates, very, very basic ones and slightly more advanced ones on the CFF website. Um, and there is one actually in GitHub. So if you create a new file that's called citation.cff, that will give you a basic template of things you can just kind of replace and, and use that for your own for your own project. And uh, going back to your comment, but tool. It's, it's still a metadata format, which is not something that I guess is supposed to be easy and straightforward, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, I find it hard myself to work with these things sometimes. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's great to hear that the, that the website helped you. And, and that's, that's definitely um, the case where we thought we, this is something that people will need because you don't want to spend the time working your, <laughs> you know, get, getting into the details of a weird metadata format just to just to be citable. Uh, that's not it's not something that your your management will appreciate, for example. So hopefully, yeah, hopefully that uh, is very helpful. Thanks for the comment. Uh, sorry, Gemma. So it wasn't your question. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, does anyone have any other question as well for Stefan? before I hand it to you again. Okay, I think we don't have any more questions. Thank you so much, Stefan. Um, over to you. Okay, thank you so much for that really good presentation. And uh, I think it's useful from two sides. One side is if the people who are here are, are the people who are watching on YouTube after write code, uh, they can learn about how to make their work citable. But even if you don't write code, remember to cite software and code that you're using because you're definitely using code if you're right here on this call. <laughs> Uh, and that's an important one to remember as well, because we all exist in an, an ecosystem where we interact and work with each other's work and build on each other's shoulders. Um, so thank you so much for that, Stefan. That's been a really good presentation um, and we're so grateful for your work around this. Um, so folks, I'm gonna just close this up. Uh, we are gonna end a little bit early. We didn't get a presentation on fair data, but I'm pretty sure that previous cohort calls we've talked about fair data anyway, because I think you can walk for more than about a minute in any conference and not have fair data. There's probably some uh, bingo game you get very drunk very fast if we tried this. <laughs> Sorry, Esther, there's an oi in chat for later context while I'm cackling on the recording. Um, okay, right, so yeah, just wrapping things up. Um, this is the last normal, plain old cohort call of OLS, um, not ever, just of OLS 5, um, and the next calls that are coming up are graduation rehearsals, so next week we have three calls, um, and the goal is, if you are a project lead, come along, practice presenting for about five minutes, the things that you can talk about, what you've done, maybe what you thought you were going to do that never happened, 
um, what you're taking to the future. No, that's not meant in a mean way. That's meant in a, um, sorry, I'm, just, I'm, I'm reacting and I don't think that their reactions are being recorded. I think it's probably just my face. So if people are wondering why I'm randomly responding to someone later on the recording, it's gonna be really weird. Uh, but my point was that sometimes when you start a project and you actually start putting work into it, you suddenly realize actually it's different from what you thought it was. And that's actually really interesting to hear and to learn about and to say, you know, we, we thought we could get so much done in, in, in three months, but actually it's a 12 month project. Or maybe it's like, um, you know, we, we, we realized the thing we wanted to focus on was tangential to what we originally thought we were going to focus on. And that's all fine. You know, we actually really like hearing about those stories um, when we were participating in the graduations. Um, so for the rehearsals, there's three slots. Each slot is the same. The idea is just to make sure that you can all make it to one if you wish to come. Uh, so sign up for one if you can. I haven't put a link yet. <laughs> I can just see a note there saying link seems broken for me. I'll fix that very soon. Um, but uh, come along as in, to one of those practice. We will offer feedback. We'll also talk about um, giving good feedback and receiving good feedback so that it's effective and that it's useful and that it's kind. Um, and then the next week we have three graduations. So if you are reasonably happy that you have plans or that you know what you've been doing and you'd like to share and you're, you've been through 16 weeks, that's fantastic. Come to those three graduations. If you're a bit tired or you're like, well, I think I wanna catch up on some of those cohort calls or maybe do a couple of assignments first. We have a couple of delayed graduations a bit later in July as well as an option. Um, so we sent those, those dates out, so everyone should have those dates in the emails. Um, we also will do one graduation in Spanish. It won't be entirely in Spanish, but we will have translators translating both ways. So you can present in Spanish and it will be translated into English, or you can present in English and it will be translated into Spanish. That's probably going to be the fifth cohort, uh, the fifth graduation in July. Um, we just need to confirm the details with our um, translators as well. Um, trying to think if there's anything else. Depending, um, because we've got five graduation slots, it may actually be that no graduation slots overrun. In the past, we always end up with one. We never know which one that everyone registers for, and it runs like an hour longer than it's supposed to. And they're amazing. I love them. But maybe with five slots, it won't happen this time. We will see. Um, if you haven't registered, please register for one. We can plan better the sooner we know how many people are going to which one. Um, and there's also a graduation guide. Uh, I'll post this again in the cohort call chat, uh, just to remind everyone. Um, I feel your pain, Kim, about juggling too many things. Uh, delayed graduation may indeed be your savior. <laughs> um, anything that I should be adding here, Batul, Esther, other people who've been around a time or two? Nothing from my side, if have read everything. Um, okay. Right, in that case, we've had a delightful call. We're actually going to end early. Uh, I know this never happens in OLS, but today it is happening. Uh, we love you, beautiful people. See you in the next few weeks for rehearsals and real graduations. Bye, all. Thank you. Bye-bye.